Hello, welcome. It's good to see you here for our second Common Good Canteen. Uh, I'm, I know some of you, but for those that don't know me, I'm Laura Gilchrist and I live in Manchester with my husband and two children. I've been involved in uh, Common Change here in Old Trafford where I live um, since it started up here. Uh, in my working life, I'm a leadership health coach, working one-to-one -one with leaders and running group programs as well. Uh, I want to introduce you to my co-host, uh, Matt Wilson, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, Matt lives in North Shields in the northeast of England. He is um, a local councillor. He runs his own management consultancy business. And he's also the chair of Common Change here in the UK. Uh, Matt and I know each other from a long time back of when we were uh, met in a church here in Manchester um, and we've, we've kept in touch since then. Uh, I also want to just give a really quick shout out to Darren Peterson. Darren, give us a wave. Um, who is the founder of Common Change globally and he's um, dialing in from California where it's 4.30 in the morning in order to give us technical support. So thank you, Darren, um, you know, kudos to you for being here. So with that note, I'm, I'm, I also want to welcome Natalie and I'm going to hand over to Matt, who's going to um, formally welcome her and introduce her. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for joining us again today. Hi, everyone. Um, you're so welcome um, here in the canteen this month. And uh, yeah, brilliant to see so many uh, folks joining us again today. Uh, we do this because we think it's really, really important um, to connect together around this theme of the common good. Um, we are people who are concerned about um, life in our communities, um, about the way that um, resources flow and are shared between us and amongst us. We're concerned about issues of poverty and issues of justice, and they're the kind of things that we talk about here in the Common Good Canteen. And helping us do that today, we have Natalie Williams. Hi, Natalie. And uh, Natalie's down in Hastings, and uh, we're gonna find out um, her perspectives on a lot of the issues that uh, we have been chewing over. And particularly, we've headlined this session today, uh, the deserving and the undeserving. And that, sort of, that reflects a, um, both the title of a book that Natalie was involved in writing a few years ago, but also um, a really important kind of mindset and attitude that we may well come up against when we're involved in uh, issues of justice and poverty fighting and trying to uh, see resources distributed. So Natalie, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to getting to know you a little bit. Um, Laura, maybe you could begin by uh, helping us to do that. Thanks, Matt. Um, Natalie, at Common Change, we, we have this tagline that together there is enough. And I'd love to hear a bit about what your experience of, of that expression is. Yeah, sure. Well, I grew up um, in poverty myself. Um, in Hastings where I now live again. Um, I grew up here in a pretty deprived area. Uh, so when I was a kid, we lived on the 16th floor of a council flat um, and didn't have any central heating. And there was one phone in the whole block of flats and things like that. So I had free school meals, as you'd expect, that sort of background. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really overly aware of being in poverty because most of my friends were in the same situation. Uh, it was actually more when I was 15 and I became a Christian that I started to be aware that other people lived lives differently to how I live. But yeah, so my my personal experience is that um, together there is enough, but the lion's share seems to be taken by a small group of people and therefore you can uh, live your life without that experience of there being enough to go around. Um, and actually even being a victim of other people having more than their fair share so to speak so yeah that's some of my background mm. that's really interesting natalie thank you thanks for being so open and sharing that um one of the things that i think we have in common in terms of the folks who tend to you know gather in this space once a month is um you know being inspired by some of the stories that we read together in the bible and it's noticeable that food plays a big part um, 
in many of those stories, particularly if you read about the life of Jesus, um, you know, whether we're thinking about the feeding of the 5,000 with those, uh, the little boy who comes along with his loaves and fish, whether it's the, you know, the last supper um, and the way that, the, you know, the bread is broken and the wine is taken um, or, you know, after the resurrection, when Jesus makes breakfast on the beach and they have sort of, you know, uh, barbecued fish together after the miraculous catch. There's so much going on around food. And uh, you're heavily invested in getting food to people who need it. Um, you're on the board of the Trussell Trust. You run a food bank. You, I believe you chair the emergency response uh, in terms of making sure that during COVID, vulnerable people have enough to eat. I mean, maybe you could just give us an example of, um, you know, the, the power of, um, food as a, as a way of sort of bringing people together or you know it's meaning in people's lives yeah um i'll give you a personal example i mean obviously like you say i'm involved in loads of um, different food provision things but i think for me food has probably been the primary way that i've experienced family um among people that i'm not related to uh, well and among people i am related to actually as well um so for me uh particularly being engaged in church life but I live on my own um I be honest with you I didn't grow up with great life skills at things that come easily to other people and so uh I know how to cook a bit now but I haven't really known how to do that and so actually just before the pandemic uh at the end of 2019 I'd managed to go 46 days in a row being fed by other people um and I uh, my mum called me a scrounger for that but I think that actually it, it was a really powerful demonstration to me. The more I got into it, the longer that time period went of just feeling a sense of belonging, of feeling that I'm family with people, of feeling like I'm um, more than just a guest in people's homes. Uh, it was really actually quite powerful in terms of uh, just, I think, helping me understand God and Christianity and church and uh, like I say, just this real sense of belonging that comes when you sit around someone's table with them, and especially when you're not treated like a guest. So especially when like, so it was 46 days, it wasn't 46 different families or different people. And so there'd be like a couple of families that were regulars in that experience. And so sometimes I'd turn up at someone's house and they'd be like, I'll put the kettle on. Um, you know, that'd be the first thing they sort of say as I walk through the door, because they'd be in the middle of something. And just um, being expected to just muck in um, and lay the table and chop things and contribute and, and whatever. Just, it, it's not being treated like you're the guest of honour. It's being treated like you you belong in that house, in that home. Yeah. And so for yeah. me, that was a really powerful pre-pandemic yeah. experience, which I think has actually kept me going during the pandemic um, yeah. when I've had to fend for myself a lot more. <laughs> yeah. You just reminded me now how much I miss that experience, actually, it, you know, I so look forward to being able to do that again. And I'm sure uh, folks on the call do as well. Um, if you weren't on, if you weren't here last month, uh, one of the things we like to do is give you an opportunity to meet to, with one another. So before we go a bit deeper with Natalie, um, we'd like to just put you into some breakout groups for five or six minutes. And so if you could just introduce yourself to one another, uh, you'll meet a bunch of people and you'll get a chance to talk to them again later in the hour. Uh, but just introduce yourself and say why you're here today, why you've decided to join in with this conversation. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope that gave you enough time just to connect and at least introduce yourselves. As Matt said, there'll be more of an opportunity in breakout rooms a bit later on to um to share with one another some of the things that, that Natalie is going to be talking to us about as well. Um, Natalie, I just wanted to dive a bit more into this, this concept of giving. And one of the things that's happened recently in um, the Common Change group that I'm part of here in Manchester is normally within Common Change, we, we get requests for um, quite small amounts sort of ranging, I guess, from, I don't know, hundred pounds, um, several hundreds, not more than that. And now this last month, we had um, a much larger request, which was going to take a significant chunk out of the pot. And it was for someone who um, basically needed several months of living expenses um, due to their personal circumstances. 
And it was a really interesting conversation that happened amongst us as to, you know, is this what the pot's for? What will that do in terms of the reserves moving forward? You know, do and, and the kind of question of dependency as well. And I think, you know, what it raised for us was um, this question around conditional and unconditional giving. And I'd love to hear a bit more around your, you know, your thoughts around that topic um, of conditional or unconditional giving. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think for the most part, uh, the way I see it is to err on the side of unconditional giving. Um, I appreciate that resources are finite, but in terms of those difficult decisions or should I give or shouldn't I give, I tend to lean towards that I'm going to give unless I can... Um, I guess almost like see a neon sign in the sky telling me not to give because I think that actually if we're going to live radically and if we're going to live differently one of the distinctives of us should be that we are a people who who do what others won't do and actually conditional giving it is everywhere conditional giving is something that we see across all sectors of society actually so I think for me unconditional giving I think as well, it's, I'm, I'm thinking about what is my responsibility compared to what is the recipient's responsibility. And so sometimes when we talk about conditional and unconditional giving, it's in terms of what will a person do with it? Will it make that much difference to their lives? Will they use what I give wisely and things like that? For me, the, that's not the, the starting place in my life that I want to ask myself. The starting place is what, what can I do here? What can I do to help? What can I do to extend mercy or kindness or compassion or generosity to the person in front of me who's in need and I think it's a fundamentally different starting place because it means you are going to err on the side of generosity and kindness and giving um, rather than erring on the side of just maybe even a bit of cynicism or skepticism which we might nicely label as wisdom but if we really dig beneath the surface it's not necessarily that we're being wise it's that we're suspicious or you know we're untrusting so for me, I really do like to bring it back to what, what, who do I want to be and how do I want to act? Mm -hmm. And if I want to be a generous person, surely that's going to be a fixed value in, in me rather than something that's dependent on the person in need. So, yeah, that's kind of my starting place for it, which um, I think is, yeah. is different to kind of charity mm -hmm. in general terms. Yeah. If I could pick up on that then, Natalie, um, maybe one of the ways that we've seen that sort of writ large um, in our sort of, you know, the public narrative in recent times has, has been through the whole Marcus Rashford food campaign that's been sort of ongoing um, and the government's response to that. And, and I think, you know, the last time that that really surfaced was when we had people posting photographs of those really meagre sort of school holiday food deliveries that arrived with um, families who, who were in poverty. Uh, and it, it, you know, it came to light that actually the contract had been outsourced to some private companies. And you know, this so-called packed lunch had ended up like costing a tenner or whatever. And uh, it was that whole question around, you know, why not just give the resources to the people who are in need? And, and it seemed like it was a mistrust essentially of those who were in need that they might kind of just, you know, take a food voucher and go and swap it for booze and fags or, or whatever sort of the, you know, uh, government were worried about. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what, what's your take on that in terms of um, how was, I guess, was that just an example that popped up in the media and, and was just a bit of a, a distraction or are those, are those real attitudes that actually do need to be challenged that people worry about um who kind of you know kind of kind of get involved in dealing with this poverty because actually people don't make good choices oh i think it's a totally real attitude i think it's the pervasive narrative um among politicians um and, and i'm not saying that to be party political i i think actually it's, it's probably across all parties in in various ways it's across the media um, that I think people can't be trusted to make good decisions. And the thing is, to a certain extent, that's true. I mean, which of us on this call hasn't made a bad decision ever? You know, I mean, I've made plenty of bad decisions. 
So it's, it's a comment that reflects human nature, but I think at the heart of it, it's about power and control. And it's about saying, we know better than you. And you, we can be trusted, but you can't be trusted. We know what's best for you. So we're going to provide what you need because you don't necessarily uh, know what's right. Or even if you do, you might not do what's right. But I do think these are attitudes that, like, I mean, I'm going to assume everyone has come on to this, this lunchtime because you're compassionate, uh, kind hearted people. But I know I'd like to think of myself like that. But even in my own heart, I know there are barriers um, that I put up to certain groups of people. So, for example, if someone doesn't say thank you, that's pretty much enough to get me quite wound up um, and think, well, maybe I wish I hadn't given to them after all, because we expect gratitude in return for what we do. Um, and I've, I, I mean, I see that play out on in tiny um, ways in my life all the time. You know, you hold a door open for someone and they don't say thank you. Um, like I say, I'd like to think of myself as compassionate, but when that happens, I want to shut the door in their face. I, like, I, I see something at work in my heart that is not that kind, that is not that nice. And I think even more so when you're giving something like um, food or you're helping someone out of debt or you're providing furniture that's needed, if, if someone's attitude actually is to act like they're entitled or they have a right and they don't seem that grateful, I think something rises up within us even then that's just a bit like, now, now you're undeserving to me because you didn't respond as I wanted you to. You didn't respond as I expected you. And I've, I've had this kind of play out in my own life. Uh, not that long ago, a, a friend of mine was telling me that her son really needed a bike and I had a bike I wasn't using. So I said that her son could have this bike. Um, and after a few weeks, she came back to me and said, he hadn't really liked the bike. I mean, it was a girl's mountain bike and I think her 13 year old son would have preferred a BMX or something. And she'd had the opportunity to get another bike. So did I want mine back? And I said to her, no, no, do you know what? Just give it to someone else. I thought, you know, I, you know, in this self-righteous way, I've done this good deed. I've given you something for free. Why don't you go and give it to someone else? Uh, one of our mutual friends later told me that this person made 300 pounds selling it on eBay. And I was really indignant. I was really like, oh, my goodness. Like, I can't believe I gave you something for free and you've like, made a profit on it. And I just felt this conviction of basically it wasn't mine anymore. Actually, it wasn't mine anymore. It was hers. So if she wants to sell it and make money from it, who am I? Like, you know, I felt this real moment just where basically a bit told off by God, if I can put it like that, because it wasn't mine. And I think if we're really honest, I mean, you guys might all be much nicer than me, but if we're really honest, we see this stuff at work in our hearts all the time, different things that raise it in us where we can write people off really quickly, even though we're trying to live lives that are full of compassion and generosity. So I think for me, my my starting place is always what's going on in my own heart, mm -hmm. actually, what's my attitude here and challenging myself before I wanna challenge someone else. Natalie, thank you so much for sharing so honestly your your own story and your own experience there with with the bike i think you've raised something really really significant there there are a couple of key points that i heard you raise one was well what about when people don't show any gratitude for what we've given to them and it's it's not even maybe acknowledged and the second thing you said is that piece around you know, we have this tendency as, as humans to want to control, you know, if, if I give that money to that person or that thing to that person, what are they going to do with it? And, you know, what I heard you go on there in terms of your internal journey is this journey around honouring the autonomy of that other person and saying, do you know what, this thing is no, this bike is no longer mine. And so what if they sold it on eBay and made a profit? Because actually, if I've given, then I've given freely. And that thing is is then belonging to that person. And, you know, I just, I really, I think that's such a great point that you've made. Thank you. I mean, I'm curious as to what you think about that question of how do we get that balance with um, honouring autonomy and being responsible? And, you know, I, I saw, I think it was Paul posted in the comments, err on the side of grace, always err on the side of grace. I'm, you know, what's your, what's your experience with that? I think it's about, if there's someone um, in front of you, whether you're passing someone on the street or someone you've met or even someone in your own family or whatever, and, and they're in need, the question 
the starting place being how can I show you kindness? How can I show you compassion? So the question isn't should I give you money or should I uh, buy you food or should I do this thing or that thing for you? It's how can I best show you kindness? So it's, that's a completely different question in my mind because it, it means I assume I'm going to do something to help you. I assume I'm going to be supportive in some way. The only question is which way is the best way to do that? And like I said, I often as well like to think about it from the perspective of what is my responsibility and what is the other person's responsibility? So if my responsibility is to be generous, let's say someone tells me that they need a couple of hundred pounds um, to pay their rent that month. And I might have all sorts of questions in my mind about whether that's what they'll actually go on or uh, what the circumstances are, how they got into that situation in the first place. But I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with how can I show you kindness? And if, if my decision then is about what, who do I want to be? What do I think I'm going to be held accountable for? If it's my generosity, then I might give to that person and think actually the bit that they're responsible for is what they do with that. So if they're, if they're not wise or they're not a good steward of what I give, I'm, that's not my um, responsibility necessarily. And I know we can, um, you know, what we don't want to do is cause people harm. So I, I'm just, there's all sorts of caveats I could add to that. But I think so often we jump to the caveats rather than lingering in the place of let me let me do what I'm responsible for. Let me err on the side of grace, err on the side of generosity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to throw up all the caveats now because I think in my experience, I need pushing to be more merciful, to be more kind, to be more generous. I don't need pushing to come up with all the caveats because that happens quite naturally. Mm. Yeah. That reminds me of, and here's one I prepared earlier. So um, I've, I've recently been rereading this, this sort of classic. Some of you will be aware of that. So Richard Foster's Money, Sex and Power. Uh, it's been around for, what, 25 years or something like that. Um, and, uh, but in the, in the money section of it, um, he talks about um, what he calls reasoned giving versus risk giving. Um, and I guess it's, you know, it's this relationship between spontaneity and stewardship. I think there's there's a, somewhere in the New Testament doesn't he talk about God loves a cheerful giver or a hilarious giver? I think is the sort of proper translation of it. And yet we we get our minds sort of caught up in this loop of stewardship, which is what we've just been spending quite a lot of time talking about, really. And uh, yeah, so I I wonder about those sort of two opposing dynamics. And uh, we had a little bit of preamble talk, didn't we, a week or two ago, Natalie and. Um, I, I was fascinated. I think you made a comment to me about about saving for a rainy day, uh, and whether that uh, you know. So do have we come down too heavily, perhaps on on sort of you know stewardship of our resources, and perhaps you know living a bit more lightly is is what God asks of us. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the most kind of radical teaching I hear on this in kind of church life, in terms of Sunday sermons, is along the lines of you know. Um, maybe give 10% to the church, give away another 10% and then spend and save the rest. And to me, that doesn't sound radical in the slightest and it doesn't particularly sound biblical. Um, you know, they're actually, uh, and I know that some will find this controversial, but it doesn't seem to me to say in the Bible to save for a rainy day and to let your bank balance go up, even if you don't know what that's for, or, you know, you're just basically accumulating. And, for me, I don't know, I'd love to see us get back to a bit more of a radical dynamic where we assume that whatever's in our bank account or whatever's in our pocket isn't just ours. Because actually the truth is, if you've got enough money in the bank to pay for stuff breaking down or, you know, to as a buffer zone for any eventuality, then you actually never need to live by faith. Um, and I think that's something that God's been personally challenging me about is, do I want to be someone who lives by faith? Because all the brilliant faith stories of provision I hear are all from people who don't have very much um you know that's that's where the real faith the rubber kind of hits the road doesn't it if you haven't got very much and and then there's miraculous provision we know those stories we hear those stories they're amazing they don't happen to people particularly who are just accumulating more and more wealth because they don't need to cry out to god they don't need to ask anyone else for help they don't need to experience community even in the same way because you can live as an island if you've always 
got enough. So for me, I, I think there's a challenge to what does it mean to live by faith? But I also think uh, my understanding of biblical stewardship is that it has far more to do with giving than with accumulating. Um, so for me, when I look at what it means in the Bible to be a good steward, it seems to mean giving away. It seems to mean being generous. And I think the problem in a, a wealthy society on the whole like ours is that we, um, even even as Christians, can have a mindset of, um, well, uh, if, a, if the thought of giving or someone presents a need to me comes into my head, I'll pray about it. I'll, I'll ponder it. I'll, I'll see if that seems good and wise. Um, whereas I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and she said, basically, if the thought comes into her head to give, she assumes that it's right to give. And she basically says, God, if you don't want me to give, then say a massive, loud, clear no that I can't ignore. And what she finds is that he doesn't say that and that she always ends up giving. And I just really like that flipping it on its head from, oh, do you want me to give? Rather, rather than ask that to ask, do you, do you, what, is there any reason why I shouldn't give right now? Um, and, and again, I think it's all about just flipping our kind of culture on, it, on its head and, and not just letting the, the culture around us of individualism and accumulating wealth and possessions just kind of pervade into us. It's, it's kind of pushing back on that and going, I need to be intentional if I'm not gonna live like that. Yeah, Absolutely, exactly. I love that perspective. Sorry, Matt. Um, I was just gonna say, we probably need to get to the next breakout groups in, 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 in a couple of minutes time. So just sort of over to you, last, last question, Laura, before we that go. That wasn't a question, it was just, oh, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. It was just to say, I love that perspective because it, you know, in our culture, there's very much that concept of independence that's so kind of almost like a God, isn't it? And, and what you're saying is actually we are our brother's keeper. And if we can see ourselves as interdependent, then it totally flips that question of should I give round to, well, why, why wouldn't I give? Um, and like as Matt said, we do want to give people a chance to talk in breakout rooms. So um, in a moment, I'm going to ask Darren to kindly open those and really just want to invite you to share in your small group, you know, what do you, what, what's inspired or challenged you about what Natalie's um, been, been sharing? And, and, you know, is there anything that you're kind of thinking that you want to go away and do differently from what she, she has shared here? Hi everyone, welcome back again. Well, I, I do hope that you uh, enjoyed your conversations with one another there. Um, and uh, yeah, we, Darren, if we could just sort of spotlight the, uh, the guests again, that'd be great. So we get a chance now for the next, uh, what time is it? Uh, for about the next 10 minutes or so um, to just sort of summarize those conversations that we've been having in the groups and put a few comments to Natalie. So what we'd like you to think about, um, if you've just had a conversation in your breakout group, um, you think is going to have you know some relevance for all the rest of us um please do just uh raise your hand uh so you can look on the bottom of your screen you should have a sort of a reactions button and you can click raise hand if you've got something that's cropped up that you think you know what you know that really flows on from the uh, the interview that we did with natalie and we'd like to perhaps hear a little bit more from natalie on that point um or maybe you know it gives us the opportunity just to shoot off an interesting tangent from from where we've been going um do, do, do stick your hand up and we'll uh, we'll have a look now okay so we've got a couple there i noticed um mark and greg their hands shot up pretty quickly um and nobody else yet at this stage so i think um it was a photo between Mark and Greg, but I think Mark got there first. So, uh, Mark, give us give us your comment and remark for Natalie, and then uh, we'll go to you in a moment, Greg. Hi, Natalie. Uh, really enjoying uh, you sharing. Thank you so much. Um, we had a, a just a, an interesting brief discussion about the way in which um, a lot of um, the sort of approaches to addressing poverty um, have become specialised industries. Um, and so you have lots of books about when helping hurts and all these other things. And I wonder if you had any reflections about what what we were we were wondering about what that means for the just the, the simplicity of loving your neighbour. And you know, does that are we in danger of disempowering that local neighbourhood love um, because that we know so much more now about systemic issues, etc. 
I don't, and so my question is, if, you know, do you have any um, thoughts for us, encouragements um, on, the, on the ground about how we, we think about these things? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's a Definitely, great question. Yeah. yeah, it's really great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so interestingly, the charity that I work for, uh, Jubilee Plus, um, helps churches all across the country to uh, support people in poverty, people who are trapped in poverty, to help lift them out of poverty. And probably the biggest question we're being asked at the moment is how do we actually go beyond all the projects that we've set up over the last 10 years or a bit longer since the global financial crash? Um, because what's happened is we've set up all these projects and that's been great, but what we've realized is it hasn't got it in the very DNA of our churches, of our people, um, that people were able to kind of tick a box by doing an hour shift, a week, a month, a, fort a fortnight, whatever. Um, and and say well that's me that's me done in caring for people in poverty um so actually one of the big things we're looking at at the moment is what does it look like to help these churches i'm encouraged that they're asking the question uh, but for me my conviction is that we are supposed to individually be those who bring mercy into our communities uh, my favorite bible verse is luke 6 verse 36 where jesus says be merciful just as your father is merciful and we actually have this incredible invitation and responsibility to um, be like the father to be like god to our neighbors to those literally around us in a physical space to those who come up to us in the street to those who come to our projects to those we encounter anywhere really for some of us it's actually even in our own families i know i've got a family member who no one else likes and no one else has wanted to connect with during the pandemic and during lockdown. And there are actually some pretty good reasons for that. But then am I going to be the one? I'm the only Christian in my family. So surely I've got to be the one who's going to love that family member, no matter how rude or cantankerous or whatever they are, or how ungrateful, whatever it is. Surely I've got to be the one who's going to bring mercy. So for me, I think we actually do need a, a, a much more radical approach to this to recognise that, Actually, we are supposed to be those who uh, carry mercy, those who carry compassion to those around us. And that has a personal application. Um, in fact, uh, Matt mentioned uh, the first book that I wrote with Martin Charlesworth, The Myth of the Undeserving Poor. But most recently, we brought out a book called A Call to Act. And that is very much about the fact that it is really easy to volunteer at a project or um, tick a box of compassion and kindness and not let it affect your whole life. So the book is about um, how do I, how is this affecting my finances, my home, my meal table? And I know obviously during lockdown, that's more complicated, but a normal life, you know, what about my friendship group? How am I personally loving my neighbor? Do you know, actually at the beginning of lockdown one, for me, loving my literal neighbors looked like sharing toilet roll. Now, who would have ever thought that was a radical act of discipleship? But actually, it was when panic buying was going on. And I found it really, really hard to give away toilet roll. I mean, how ridiculous does that sound? But, you know, actually, that's part of my, I don't just want to talk about this. I don't just want to write about it. I don't just want to get involved in projects. I've got to live this out in whatever practical yeah. ways that means. So for me, yeah. there's a massive journey for us to go on of recognizing that actually this should be a normal part of discipleship. It's not for a few enthusiasts who give up their lunchtime to come on a zoom call it's actually for anyone who claims to be a follower of jesus and i think there's a long way to go before that is the culture of our churches yeah yeah thank you let's have a comment from greg as well okay um can you hear me yeah go ahead okay um i think natalie's quite right to push this personal responsibility uh, i recognize in myself there's a mean and controlling streak when I sort of feel I ought to be Never. generous to people. Uh, and I do on occasion walk by people who are, are in need and that is not one of the best things about me. I'm thankful I have a wife who's much more spontaneous in her generosity. And she's done things like give away rooms in our house and give away lots of our money without even bothering to uh, to talk it over with me and I think that is, is actually good that, but there are some situations where Greg if we could just have a question so that Natalie can respond to you is, do you think though there are some situations where it's more important to have a, a structured response for example where there 
there is a big need. Uh, I think of the case of uh, a uh, illegal migrant. Well, that's not quite the right word, but an undocumented migrant woman and her daughters uh, who needed uh, something like five thousand pounds to pay for government fees to get her status and her permission to stay regulated and. We did that, but we couldn't do it out of our own money. So we, we had to organize something between our church and another church and a just giving page and all sorts of okay. things. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So let's hand that over to, to, to Natalie. So yeah, when does the personal sort of switch into the programmatic or you know into the sort of structural then, then Natalie? Well, I, I think, it, you know, it's hard to give an exact, right? This is the line. I think the important thing is to recognize that it's both. It's the same as when we get into debates as to is it about church or charity or is it about um, state and government and policy? Actually, it's never as clear cut as it's one or the other. I know many of us, myself included, would like kind of neat little boxes uh, to put things in. But I think actually the truth is it's about everything. Everything is necessary. And that's why we need to influence every area. It's why it's not enough to just... Um, you know, get involved in people's lives and love your neighbour. We have to, at some point, be influencing the systems that hold people and trap people in difficulties as well. So for me, it is definitely both things that are necessary. I'm not sure I can draw for you a neat line that will tell you when to go, when I would cross from one point to another. Um, I don't think that line exists. I think it's something that is different in every community, different in every street, different in in every neighborhood. But yeah, what I would say is that it, it does have to be both. We have to uh, bring change at a systemic level, not just on an individual level, but we shouldn't neglect the individual while we're off trying to change policy. If, we, if I could bring in Laura at this point as well. And so Laura, what, what, what I'd like to ask you is, um, so, you know, you're part of a common change group, which means that along with a bunch of friends in your neighborhood, you know, you, you all put into a, a kind of a common pot, you put a bit of money in every month and that pot grows. Um, and you explained to us earlier that, you know, you a, a request to come up recently for quite a, quite a lot of money. Um, that was more than you would normally give out of that pot. So the question I'm thinking there is I'm assuming that, you know, you and Ben don't only give from that pot. And so how do you distinguish when a need might be something that you might want to just meet on your own uh, or whether you might go to the group and say actually we've got a larger resource here that we might be able to unlock for this individual or is, is that a, 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 thought, a, a kind of process you've ever had to go through oh gosh it's a great question matt and i just wanted to i will answer it but i just wanted to say for people that were wondering that we did agree to that um, that uh, gift the larger gift but and it was a really similar to this conversation it was a really fruitful and interesting conversation that emerged in the process of making that decision so i just wanted to let people kind of know the ending to the story before we wrap up i think um i think for us to be honest with you it comes down to um what we can afford like if we've got if you're talking you know 10 20 30 pounds then that's probably something we could do from our own pocket but if you if it's more than that then it's probably going to need more than just us to be giving into yeah. it and one of the things I really love about common change is that if we do have a friend who needs you know the, the more like a hundred couple of hundred three hundred we're not just sat there going, oh, wish we could help them, but we can't. We, we actually do have this resource that's very, very easy to access, that's relationally based, that's, you know, we can go to people and say, this is, this is something that we can access quite quickly because often these needs are, need a fast turnaround. So I think for us, it's very much about what we have <laughs> yeah yeah well uh, yeah I'm, I'm sure that will resonate with i know that the, the on the call today we've got a bunch of people who are who are part of common change groups in different parts of the country and a lot of our friends who are not but i guess know a little bit about um the sort of principles of, of of what we do and how we operate i'm conscious we're just about running out of time so we probably need to sort of do our thank yous and our wrapping up um Shall, why don't I do a little trailer for next month and then, Laura, you can sort of wrap up and say, say the thank you. So, um, yes, next month. Um, so what are we on today? Is it the 24th? Yeah, so it's, it's the 24th of March, Wednesday, 24th of March, 12.30. We're going to have Mike Royal with us. 
Um, Mike, uh, m- many of you will know from the Cinnamon Network, he's, uh, he's actually he's a bishop these days uh, in a, a Pentecostal denomination. I worked with Mike a few years ago, an education charity. Wonderful, wonderful guy. He's going to help us uh, to deal with the question of power and privilege. Um, and that will touch on some of those topics that get talked about in the Black Lives Matter conversation, etc., um, that, that Mike's been very involved in. So very important in our kind of understanding of uh, giving and generosity. But uh, so that's next month. So make sure you uh, check in for that one. And, and what's the date for that, Matt? 24th, Wednesday, the 24th of March. March. Thank you. Um, super. Natalie, I just want to say a huge thank you to you. It It's been so inspiring and challenging and wonderful to hear a bit about your story and your experiences um, here today. I I kind of wish we had a bit longer. There's so many more things that I want to ask you and and dive into, but it's been really good to um, to hear just a bit about your experiences. And I'm sure I speak for others in saying that, uh, that I'm certainly feeling challenged going away from this conversation. I also want to um, say a big thank you uh, to Darren who got up at 4 a.m. his time in order to support us with the technicalities of of running this thing. Um, And to all of you for giving up, you know, an hour of your lunchtime. I hope um, you'll agree with me that, you know, it's been a valuable use of your time. And we really hope to see you uh, next month on the, uh, the 24th of March. Thank you so much. Great. See you all. Thank you. From walking away, let your friends laugh, even this I can say.